Greetings comrades, my name is Gigantos, welcome to another In A Nutshell video. So in this video we'll basically be looking at the Council of Nicaea in a nutshell. Rather the first Council of Nicaea, because there was another one that came later. Anyway, to get into it. So the first Council of Nicaea took place in 325 AD. Quite early, so it was the first ecumenical council because the Council of Jerusalem was technically pre ecumenical, but this was the first proper church council. Pope at the time was Pope Saint Sylvester I, who was Pope of between 314 and 335, and the president of the council was Saint Hosius of Cordoba. It was overseen by Empress Saint Constantine I, who was emperor between 307 and 337 AD. Okay, so, the background to this council basically, before this point in time, and although some people moan about how it was here that Catholicism and stuff was founded. It wasn't really. It was it was still Catholicism. The Catholic Church is the oldest and original church there is. It's just that before the Canicene Council, there wasn't much organization to the church overall. It was just groups of churches really, and maybe a few bishops talking to each other and listening to Peter, or the successor of Saint Peter, as who was a you know as the Pope, maybe he didn't have that name yet, but there wasn't much structure to the church really. The bishops needed to get together compile their, doc their doctrines and organize them and get everyone to understand that this is what they believe. They wanted to actually have an organized religion as opposed to Gnosticism. They also needed to deal with the rise of Arius at the time, who founded Arianism, one of the oldest and longest running opposition to the church, especially on the rise of fundamentalism. They also had to deal with the Melchian Schism, and they also needed to deal with the date of Easter, because at that point in time they were relying on the Jewish calendar. However, they uh, the Christians wanted to become independent from the Jewish calendar and wanted to have their own calendar. So what actually happened there? Well, an invitation was sent out to all 1,800 bishops, however, only 318 turned up. So Arianism was the first thing dealt with. And for those of you that don't know, which is a bit of a surprise, especially coming to theology, because Arianism is like probably the first thing you're gonna learn about if there's a threat to the church, as opposed to the Roman persecutions. Basically, Arianism says that Jesus wasn't God. And this is oddly relevant for me, because I'm actually been dealing with a lot of Arians lately. Basically, Christ has two natures in him. He has a human nature and a divine nature. The human nature he got when he was born in the flesh, and the divine nature was because he was God. According to Arianism, Jesus didn't have a divine nature. He was created, and the highest among all creatures, but he wasn't God. And of course, there were various versions that did come in the 2000, almost 1,700 years after him after the Arius came about, but that's basically the core of Arianism. Jesus wasn't God, he was a human. So Arius was invited to begin the council to speak, so everyone could hear what he had to say, and all the bishops sat there respectfully listening to him. However, one bishop didn't like this. He was a bishop of Myra, and he was not happy at listening to Arius and his heresies. And it got to the point that he got so angry, this bishop walked up to Arius and either punched or slapped him. That bishop's name was Saint Nicholas. Yes, the guy Santa Claus is based on slapped Arius for being a heretic and spreading his heresies everywhere. And because St. Nicholas had displayed violence in front of the Emperor, who was... Okay, Empress St. Constantine, he was... Again, he didn't really... He didn't have any role in this council. He just convened it, and he was just sitting there watching, and he didn't have a vote in anything. He was just there basically to keep order. And because he had shown violence in front of the Emperor, St. Nicholas was had his robes removed and his hats and everything, so he looked like a layperson and he was basically sent to spend the night in the prisons. However, in the middle of the night, Jesus and the Virgin Mary appeared to him, and they asked him, why are you in prison? And then St. Nicholas said, because I love you so much. And so Jesus and the Virgin Mary gave him his bishop's robes and everything back, and he spent the rest of the night writing scripture and reading it. And when the jailer came down the next day, he saw that the man who had gone in there without robes, suddenly fully dressed, like probably just like wide awake, waiting for what's gonna happen next. So the jailer went to tell Emperor St. Constantine, and he was let out. And he spent the rest of that council basically countering everything Arius said. Because Arius was using quotes, usually out of context or misunderstood, like John 14, 28 and 1 Colossians 1, 15. The quotes in order to prove that Jesus was God were brought forward, like John 1, 1 and John 10, 30. In fact, the Gospel of John is known for presenting Jesus as God. And I'll cover that in when I do the, the Gospel of John in a nutshell. And it wasn't only St. Nicholas who, started, who was countering Arius here. It was as the apprentice of... Saint Alexander I of Alexandria, the Patriarch of the Church of Alexandria, was Saint Athanasius of Alexandria. Both Saint Athanasius and Saint Nicholas would spend the rest of their lives countering Arianism. So what happened was after the debate was pretty much over, so Arius shared his side, so Saint Nicholas and possibly Saint Athanasius and any of the other people who opposed Arius stepped forward and put forward their quotes. 
everyone had a vote. Basically, Arius had a lot of support for his beliefs, and he went in there with like six or eight uh, supporters or something. However, when the council was put to vote, all those that wanted to condemn Arianism as a heresy numbered 316, which meant that only two bishops supported Arius. Now, some people might say, okay, well, the slap never happened because only bishops were allowed to be in that meeting and Arius wasn't a bishop. However, let's be honest, what better way would you to listen to a church teaching other than the person who apparently came up with it, right? Arius was probably invited as a guest of honor to basically just say what he wanted to say and just have all the people listening to him. Because why else would, why else would they restrict him? Because they, you know, they, might, they might get what Arius is saying across wrong. So you know, let Arius go there speak for himself. So there's no way that Arius wouldn't have been prevented from going to the council meeting. He may, may have just only been there concerning Arianism, but he needed to be there to actually get his beliefs across. So the story of, of St. Nicholas slapping Arius, there's no chance of it being made up. And of course some people may say that, okay, while well, St. Nicholas of Myra wasn't mentioned on the records, but let's be honest, St. Nicholas lost his temper at Arius, and we can laugh about it now. But St. Nicholas lost his composure at that meeting. In order to save him some face, the people probably didn't really mention him very much at the, being, actually, being actually present in the council. I mean, you'd do that for your friend if he did something stupid at the meeting, wouldn't you? Even though we can laugh at this event now. So only two supported Arius in his claims, and Arianism was declared a heresy. In order to stop Arianism ever resurfacing again, although it will take a very while for it to actually disappear or at least be suppressed, the church fathers there and the bishops decided to form the Nicene Creed, which we recite in churches nowadays. Although, okay, technically we recite the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, but the Nicene Creed was the first part of this, and it basically defined the relationship of God the Father and God the Son in relation to each other, and said that they were both God. No one greater than the other in divinity, both were equal, both were God. Now, there are certain words used in this, and I say certain words because they're very hard for me to pronounce. I could try and pronounce them if you want. Right, so I had to later today because it was very hard to pronounce. The word that basically meant similar substance, which supported Arianism, was homoousios. Okay, and the word used to support the Catholic view for the Trinitarianism, which means same substance, is homoousios. There is literally a single I in the difference of these pronunciations. But that makes all the difference. But these words weren't used often because the Gnostics were using it at that point in time. So it was just consubstantial and Arian. But basically, God the Father and God the Son are consubstantial with each other. So after Arianism had been settled, then came the date of Easter, which was finally separated from the Jewish calendar. It would require some more reforming later on, but it was settled. And then the next up was the Dean of the Malician Schism. Basically, Malicious was a bishop who refused to give communion to those who had lapsed during the persecutions of the Christians, saying that they didn't have enough faith and, des and didn't deserve to be let back into the church or receive the communion. Now, this is a little bit unfair. Let's be honest, not a lot of people would have gone through what some of the martyrs and those who did survive the persecutions did go through. I mean, the Council of Nicaea was so soon after the last persecution that some of the bishops there actually had wounds from those persecutions still. But not everyone is as brave or as strong as them, let's be honest. Now, people may give in, however, the church's ability to forgive, our ability to forgive, is what allows lapsed Christians to be ret to return back to the church. That's what mercy is. They may consider themselves not worthy of going back, or other people may consider themselves not worthy of it, but remember, mercy is given when it's not deserved. That's why it's called mercy. In order to counter malicious, his power was massively restricted by Rome. He was not allowed to ordain any more bishops, and he would be observed by others closely for the rest of his life. And he and his sect of heretics would eventually join Arian the Arianism, or rather form of it, but they would eventually disappear or die out from the mid-5th century. Also in the church council were the first set of canon laws, about 20, and they helped define the faith. They mostly dealt with Arianism, and they also dealt with certain ecclesiastical disciplines and stuff like that. I won't cover them all in this video, because these canons are prone to changing, and they have done so several times throughout history. So we have to do a video about the development of canon law. So as a result of this council, Arianism was condemned, and his followers were excommunicated as heretics. And this was technically, for, in terms of an ecumenical council, it was the first infallible doctrine as defined by the church, which is why we know that Arianism is wrong, because the Holy Spirit leading the church would not lead it into doing wrong. And the Holy Spirit led the church into condemning Arianism, which means that the Holy Spirit couldn't lie to us about condemning Arianism, which means the Holy Spirit leading the Pope's actions and all the other bishops there were condemning Arianism as an infallible doctrine. Easter was no longer reliant on the Jewish calendar. Malicious was restricted in his authority, 
and is heresy condemned? The first canon laws were written, and just to cover the misconceptions about this council, the biblical canon was not sorted or defined during this ecumenical council. And I know Dan Brown made it seem like it was, but it really wasn't. At this point in time, the biblical canon was very near to completion, but it was not finished yet. I think it would be finished, at least the final draft would have been done by, what was it, 382 at the Synod of Rome? However, the point is, at this point in time, the biblical canon did not exist, nor did Empress St. Constantine interfere with it in any way. He was just there as an observer. Also, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity was not defined during this church council meeting. This council only dealt with Christ's divinity. It was the next council, the first council of Constantinople, that dealt with the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And after that, then, Trinitarianism had been properly defined. Trinitarianism was not defined as council. It was, it was getting there, but it was not finished yet. I know it happened a little bit after this actual council, and I already tried to explain the situation here, but Emperor St. Constantine did not impose his views on this council, nor was he an Arian. I mean, if he was an Arian at that point in time, then it would prove that he didn't have any interference in the council's meeting, because it went against what he believed. At this point in time, although Constantine was, I guess you could say, in his heart a Christian, he had not been baptized yet. That would come on his deathbed later, and there would be no political repercussions for him. However, he did not impose his views on this church council. He had no say, he was just there to keep an eye on everyone. But that's basically the first council of my scene in a nutshell. So like this video, please do give it a like, please do share my other videos, please do comment what you think of them, please subscribe to my channel so you can see more content, please ring the bell so you can keep up with the video releases. Next episode, we'll do the first council of Constantinople, which as I said, we'll be looking at, as a central point, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. But that'll be it for then. So see you next video, comrades. Until then.